Hello, everybody. Welcome back, enthusiasts of the ancient Near East. Well, people with nothing better to do with their time on a no, Sunday no, no. evening. No, 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 they're, they're intentionally here, intentionally here. I'm Dr. Josh, this is Megan, soon to be Dr. Megan. We're by soon, sorry, I just need to mute my computer then. Yeah, there we go. By soon, he means in the next- Come on, relatively speaking, that's not too bad. Yes, maybe. So, uh, we decided that we don't live stream enough. Josh decided that. Oh, I'm just- I decided that. <laughs> now, uh, so I, you know, there are a lot of people uh, uh, that do sort of like Bible studies on YouTube and they, they read through um, books of the Bible. Uh, I'm, I'm on with Skylar, for example, and uh, we were supposed to do one tonight, but uh, some stuff has come up. We're going to do it tomorrow night, which is amazing. Please tune in for that. It's going to be great. But, you know, we thought there are a lot of people going through the Bible. Um, but how many people are going through ancient Near Eastern stuff? How many people are going through this stuff from Mesopotamia? No one. Yeah. Because they have best things to do with their time. Right. Well, there's... <laughs> Sorry. I love what I do. I'm just being mean. <laughs> oh, someone actually came here from Milwaukee Atheists. Oh, Hello right. and welcome. <laughs> so we decided, and actually I was on with the Milwaukee Atheists today. Phenomenal, phenomenal channel. If you haven't gone there and subscribed, uh, please do so now if you can do that can you do that yes yes well even if you can't go do it anyway, do it anyway. Uh, no but great guys had a lot of fun with them today go check out the stream uh, they have a, a Sunday um, atheist Sunday school which is fantastic they got a great patreon and good group so behold behold yes uh, <laughs> but um, you know, going through that, we're, they're going through the Book of Judges right now. And I just thought, actually, we were driving back from dinner tonight. And I said, you know what? Why don't we go on and do a stream and start just going through some of these more interesting Akkadian stories, uh, these Mesopotamian stories in Akkadian, and then we'll do some in Sumerian. And I, of course, I thought, well, they're all interesting, right? And I know you all agree. And so we um, we decided what we do is kind of read through it and then give commentary as we go. And of course, there's a lot more commentary available for biblical books, but not a lot for um, ancient Near Eastern stuff. Or, what this or, means is we're making up a lot of our own commentary. We are. Yeah. OK, that's what we're doing. But anyway, uh, but we know what we're talking about. You know, that also, much. we're doing this instead of getting ice cream. Yeah. So. Uh, so, uh, side note, thank you to Shane for moderating. Yep. Um, I didn't know that was a thing, but it is. And he emailed us and said, moderating's something that's good to have. So we, we don't know what we're doing really is no. so. but you do. Well, sometimes, sometimes. So we decided that we would start with kind of a light one, um, something really fun, actually something that I have, uh, summarized on, I don't know if it was on a daily data or maybe a Saturday. It was a Saturday literature thingy. There you go. So it's called The Poor Man of Nippur. It's a first millennium Akkadian text. It is one of my favorite stories. Mine too. It's hilarious. It really is. Um, before we jump into it, uh, I wanted to give you a little update on where we are with the channel. Uh, we, we are amazing. Yeah, we just this passed 825 subscribers. Woo! You guys are incredible. We were doing some reading on um, the worldwide internet today about YouTube related things. And it says that we have to have 4,000 viewing hours. We have 1,755 viewing hours. Um, I don't know if that's good, but um, I know we do a lot of shorter videos. So maybe that's why, but you know, hey, help us get there. You know, tell your friends, you know, if you're, uh, if you're enjoying what you're seeing, uh, let everybody know because um, we need the subscribers, I guess, or the viewing hours or something. I'm going to stop talking now. I love you. I love you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're going to be looking at the poor man of Nippur, as Josh said. I put a link in the live chat to his summary video, and we are using this translation. This is Before the Muses by Benjamin Foster. 
um, an excellent book. I think it's available on, on Amazon for the princely sum of 30 bucks, maybe. Yeah. Highly recommended. It's yeah. like this big. You could kill someone with this book. I have. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it, but you could if you felt so inclined. Um, but it has a whole load of literary texts divided by chronological period, but then also by genre. So if you want to know about uh, mythological compositions from 1000 to 100 BC, there's a section for that. So highly recommended. It's a great book. Um, Foster is an excellent academic and provides some very interesting and helpful footnotes and introductions to the texts. So yeah, worth awesome. getting. So we have called this um, the Digital Hammurabi Book Club. And I think probably, you know, tonight would be a little different because we just sprung this on you. But you know, it would be phenomenal if you guys were to get this and we kind of set up maybe a, um, a sequence of text that we're going to read. And then in the live chat, you guys could interact with us about it, ask questions, make comments, you know, about the story. I think that'd be really cool. Have a little bit of a book club. So, um, and maybe for our Patreons, you know, we do a special reading and we'll actually do a live Google, I mean, a, a Google Hangout. I guess it would be live, just not recorded. Yes. I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, but lots of possibilities. So what I'll do is I'll summarize very briefly the story so that you know what you're getting into when we start reading this thing. And then Megan's going to give you some uh, quick insights to some of the nuances of the story. And then we'll get right into it. So not right into it, but we'll get into it at some point in the future soon. Sorry. So the poor man of Nippur, uh, story in Akkadian, it's uh, about this guy that's, oh, you know, he's down to his last penny and he comes up with this bright idea that he's going to go to the mayor and try to get some help. Well, the mayor totally disses him. And so he steals his goat, eats yeah. his goat. Yeah. Not it's, cool. It's, it's no good. Um, and so as he, as he gets thrown out of the mayor's, um, the mayor's place he says uh to the guard uh for this one insult that the mayor has uh given me i'm gonna repay him three and so the story is about him you know doing all these tricky things to come back and trick the mayor and beat him up and then leave and come back and trick him again and beat him up again and uh it's a lot of fun Sounds really Despite terrible. All the grievous bodily harm. Yeah, but it's but it's funny how he does it, and um, I don't know. I, it's, again, it's one of my favorite texts because it's a lot, it's, it's satirical. I mean, it really is a funny story. It's meant to be that way. So, Megan, aren't there some Megan? Aren't there some interesting things about the story in the Akkadian? Well, Josh, that is a fascinating mm -hmm. question. Thank you for asking me. Um, so, first, I want to talk quickly about the personal names. Um, I keep meaning to do a video about Akkadian and Sumerian personal names because they're fantastic things. Much like Hebrew, um, names in Akkadian and Sumerian are sentences that mean things. So the protagonist of this story is called Gimil Nanorta, which means... The favor of Nanorta. And the... Like a party favor. Not, not like a party favor. No, not like that. No. Um, <laughs> and the... The porter or the, the the guard at the gate is called to culti Enlil, which means I don't know. Weapon of Enlil. Enlil and Nanorta are both I knew what it was. <laughs> Enlil and Nanorta, Joshua, are both gods from Mesopotamia, obviously. Um, yeah, they are. <laughs> we're both drinking. That may or may not be clear about now. Um so they're both gods, they're divine figures, and it was um, very common in the ancient world to have a name that was a sentence involving a particular god. It showed your family's allegiance to that particular deity. Um, you get in some periods um, family groups with the same, like the same god names in their personal names. Um, so you have things like uh, Shamash gave a son or the king well no Sargon is a special case we'll talk about Sargon in a minute or like Gimel Nanorta Nanorta's favor <clears throat> just showing um 
like that you are smiled upon by a particular deity or that you're associated with a particular deity. Um, some names are also very interesting because they tell you something about the person who took that name, specifically royal names. Um, I'm thinking in particular of King Sargon. The first or the second, there are two of them, the name means the same thing. Um, and I'm going to butcher the Akkadian. It's Sharukin. There we go, Sharukin, which literally translated means the king is legitimate. What? I just always find it funny when you you name yourself like, I don't know, like the, the king is the best. It's Honest. like, it, I really am. I really am the best. Yeah. It's like when you drive a really big truck. Exactly. Um, so <laughs> Sargon's name in Akkadian is actually Sharukin, which means the king is legitimate, which suggests that, you know, that king probably wasn't a legitimate heir to the throne. Um, and we know that Sargon the first kind of stole the throne from someone else and then named himself the king is legitimate to try and cover up the fact that he was a usurper um and the original king was probably not terribly happy with him and probably very dead <laughs> shut up well i mean that probably those two things are true i, I mean if, if someone had killed me i'd not be very happy with them i'd also be very dead so going back to the matter at hand names are really interesting um, so that was the name thing. Um, this text is also in the original Akkadian full of interesting wordplay um, and intentional humour. There's a fantastic article that I've put in the description about um, the wordplay, the punning, and also the, the visual humour, which sounds a little bit weird until you remember that this was written in cuneiform and a cuneiform sign can have several different meanings. So you can look at a sign in a, a string that make up a word and it's a particular um, syllabic value. And you know what it says because you've got the signs around it to give you context. But you also know that that sign means something else kind of either associated with that word or possibly um, with the word above it, which recalls previous lines to your brain. Um, again, I've linked the article. We don't have time to go into all of that. Uh, and honestly, my cadence is rusty enough that I really wouldn't want to without a lot more work, but it's very interesting. And if you can find the article, it is available online. I'd recommend reading it. Every Assyriologist, by the way, would say that. And every serious, I think, Hebrew scholar would say that. That no matter how good they are, they would say, oh, you know, my Akkadian's a little rusty. I'd want to I'd want to read up on that. Humor, especially in ancient worlds, is very, very difficult because it's such a specific thing to a culture. You get this whole weird British humor versus American humor and things that I think are hilarious and will have me on the ground screaming with laughter generally confuse a lot of my American friends. The deflowered girl became pregnant, or did not become pregnant. The undeflowered girl became pregnant. Who, or what is it? That's Acadian humor. Auxiliary forces. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> Tell me you're hanging, you Sorry. know I got poor circulation. <laughs> All right, well, enough of our poor, poor attempts at humor. No wordplay intended there because of because of poor is it's good like okay it. awesome I like it. well do you want me to start yes excellent well here we oh, go before we start rachel easton is saying that akkadian is of course related to hebrew but she's not sure how close the relationship is yes related to hebrew related to arabic um they're all semitic languages they all use very similar um three root word systems um and a lot of the word meanings that they're not the same words but words with the same roots often have related meanings in the different languages. So Shemesh is son, uh, Shamshum is... Um, Shemesh in Hebrew is son, Shamash in Akkadian is yeah. son. Yeah. I don't know Arabic, so I can't comment on that. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Yep, same okay. root. There we go. Josh knows. Um, right. So good point. Sorry. I meant that. It was, it was a good point. It was a good point. Yeah, not a lot of people know that. No. All right, well, here we go. There once was a man of Nippur, poor and needy. His name was Gimon the Norta, which we know means yeah. the favor of the Norta. That's what you were going to say. Mm -hmm. I can tell. Mm -hmm. She didn't know I was going to ask her that. Mm -mm. I'm in trouble. <laughs> His name was Gimon the Norta. You know, when you said that, I almost did the. <laughs> <laughs> Our son Oliver has been going. <laughs> He's only seven months old, and that's just the funniest thing in his entire world right now. It really is. So we're all doing it. 
and then I thought that probably wasn't great to do on a live stream, and I just did it like three times. So yeah. anyway, that's, that's how we roll. Yeah, let's let's stop doing that now. <laughs> his name was Gimel Nenorta, a wretched man. He dwelt in his city Nippur in abject misery. He had no silver, as befits his people. He had no gold, as befits humankind. His larder wanted for pure grain. His insides burned, craving for bread. His face was wretched, craving meat and good drink. Every day, for want of a meal, he went to sleep hungry. He wore a garment for which there was none to change. He took counsel with his wretched heart. Quote, I'll strip off my garment for which there is none to change. I'll buy a ram in the market of my city, Nippur. So Nippur, just to kind of, we're going to break in a little bit here. And feel free, obviously, to stop me when you want to I comment. Always do. Uh, Nippur is a very important city in Mesopotamia, of course, in the early second millennium. It's, it's this religious center. And it remains a religious center for a long, long, long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so anyway, it's the, the city of the god Enlil, uh, which is, you know, for those of you who know anything about Mesopotamian Pantheon, it's a big deal. Uh, but it's also the scribal center. It's um, it's just a, it's a very important city. And so uh, the mayor, of course, if you've been watching our um, uh, summary of Elio Oppenheim's book, you know, the, the people that are in charge of cities and of towns are supposed to be taking care of their people and their citizenry. So um, he says here that he's going to buy a ram in the market of his city, Nippur. And um, he says he stripped off his garment for which there was none to change. Meaning that was his only item of clothing. So he's trading his only yeah. shirt, basically, for That's a right. goat. He bought a three-year-old nanny goat in the market of his city, Nippur. So it's interesting that he was going to buy a ram, but he ends up buying a goat. Uh, there's thought that there's some humor involved there. The so I did a quick bit of reading. There's a suggestion that the ram would have been more expensive. In some, in a different um, copy of this text, it's initially a sheep. And the argument is maybe that the ram or the sheep would be more expensive. A ram is a sheep, isn't it? Yeah, but, it's, but, that, but the point um, is that, yeah, I mean, the point is that... Um, he couldn't even afford a sheep. Yeah, that's he's right. so poor, he can't even afford a sheep, which is the preferred meat, so he has to settle for a goat. Yeah. Poor dude. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so... He says, what if I slaughter, did I skip a word? No, he took counsel with his wretched heart. What if I slaughter the nanny goat in my yard? There won't be a meal. Where will be the beer? My friends in my neighborhood will hear of it and be angry. My kith and kin will be furious with me. So culturally speaking here, if he were to slaughter um, the goat, it would be cause for a celebration and a banquet and you invite your friends and your neighbors to share this goat with you and he's like well i don't want to do that because i don't have any more food but if i don't do it they're going to be really really pissed with me that's right so oh so. We have, sorry we do have a question before we get any further iron charioteer says quick question did the sumerians drink warm beer or did they have the ability to cool it since you are enjoying a cold one i suspect it was warm i think so i don't know for a fact but if if big if here bearing in mind that i don't know the answer um if they did have the ability to call it i suspect that would be expensive involving shipping yeah. ice down from mountains somewhere so yeah. your average mesopotamian person like our friend gimel nanorta here probably would have enjoyed his beer warm your amp yes average mesopotamian person you heard it here first <laughs> and i'm gonna and I, I i'm last. going to read something now oh yeah sorry <laughs> shut up josh <laughs> i love you um so my kith and kin will be furious with me i'll take the nanny goat and bring it to the mayor's house i'll work up something good and fine for his pleasure so he's going to take the goat to the mayor kind of in the hope of receiving some kind of help or assistance or maybe some more food um gimel nanorta took his nanny goat by the neck he went off to the goat of the, the goat he went off to the gate of the mayor of nipple to Tukulti Enlil, who minded the gate, and we know that Tukulti Enlil means... It's something awesome. Weapon of Enlil. Come on, somebody. He said these words. Say that I wish to enter to see the mayor. The doorman said these words to his master. My lord, a, t a citizen of Nippur is waiting at your gate, and as a greeting gift, he has brought you a nanny goat. 
The mayor was angry with Tukulti Enlo. Why is a citizen of Nippur kept waiting at the gate? The doorman said something. We don't know what. Probably, fuck you. <laughs> probably Pro not. Probably not that. Gimil Ninorta came happily before the mayor. But you, but you hear that, uh, you know, why, why is a citizen of Nippur, this important city, my city, why is he being kept waiting at the gate? Right? The, the, he, he's supposed to... He's there to care for the citizenry. So you, you expect, following that response, that, okay, great, the mayor's going to be nice to uh, Gimil the Norta and he'll get maybe a sheep or another shirt, possibly because Gimil the Norta is currently naked, if we remember the beginning of the story. So, with bated breath, we work out what happened. Um, Gimil the Norta came happily before the mayor. When Gimil the Norta came before the mayor, he held his nanny goat by the neck with his left hand. With his right hand, he greeted the mayor. May Enlil and Nippur bless the mayor. May Ninorta and Nusku make his offering flourish. Um, so, pretty standard. Social inferior greeting his hmm. superior. Praise be to you. I hope the gods bless your family, give you bountiful crops, blah de blah de blah The mayor said these words to the citizen of Nippur. What is your trouble that you bring me a gift? Gimel Ninorta related his errands to the, the mayor of Nippur. Every day, for want of a meal, I go to sleep hungry. I stripped off my garment and am currently naked. <laughs> the text doesn't say that at all. I'm just embellishing. For which there is none to change. I brought a three-year-old nanny goat in the market of my city Nippur. I said to myself, on account of my wretched heart, what if I slaughtered the nanny goat in my yard? There won't be a meal. Where will be the beer? My friends in my neighborhood will hear of it and be angry. My kith and kin will be furious with me. I'll bring the nanny goat to the mayor's house. That's what I said in the wretchedness of my heart. And if you've been following any of the literary readings I've been doing, you'll notice that this text, like every other Mesopotamian text, has repetition, has blocks of text repeated. Um, and if you've been listening to her, um, her readings, you've probably been doing it like this. Nope. Oh, nope. well, that's how I do it. Nope. They are. They're doing it like nope. that. Sorry, I'm looking to see if there are. Oh, so Christian Trask says one can cool liquids in a porous clay container through evaporation. I didn't know that. Maybe they could cool their beer. We need to get a beer cooling specialist on Yeah, there. a BCS. Exactly, exactly. So you... I'm going to break briefly and say, so I have um, one of the commentaries I was referring to up on my lovely laptop over here, which is why I keep looking here because I'm reading comments. Um, and like I said, this text is abundant in wordplay and puns and all kinds of exciting stuff that we can't really go into because it would take too long and because we haven't sat down and translated through it ourselves. Um, Not in a while. I, I've never done Poor Man's Nipple. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. She's done a lot of very difficult texts that I have not done, so I just want to be funny. I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm just going to read something to you here because I think it's relevant. Puns involved, so this is from mm, Dr. Nogle. I hope I pronounced that right. Puns involving similar sounding words occur between biltu, tribute or burden, and baltu, strength and life. The similarity in sound between these words and the frequency with which they occur suggests that a certain amount of illusion is at work. So we'll see that further on, but when you see the words um, tribute or burden or gift, so the greeting gift, I suspect, is that word. Um, and so when the mayor says, what is your trouble that you bring me a gift? That, it's that word. So it, it is the word for gift, but it sounds very much like um what did i just say strength and life so tribute burden strength life this is the sort of stuff if you you know know things about the psalms for example you come to psalm 119 or psalm 145 and you have an acrostic psalm you know those are things that you're not going to pick up in the translation but to the person reading the text in the original it jumps out at you mm -hmm. there's an olive bake kimmel dollar hay and so on um so this is the sort of play that um you know, that you would see. Uh, it, of course, is the same in any, any language. You can do this sort of thing, so. 
All right, so the text is broken a little bit. Um, then the mayor has the goat slaughtered. And he says, give him, the citizen of Nippur, a bone and gristle. Give him third-rate beer to drink from your flask. Expel him. Throw him out of the gate. And this is the exact opposite response that you would expect from the mayor. He gave him, the citizen of Nippur, a bone and gristle. He gave him third-rate beer to drink from his flask. He expelled him, threw him out the gate. As Gimel the Norta went out of the gate, he said to the doorman who minded the gate these words, Joy of the gods to your master, tell him thus, For the one disgrace you laid upon me, for that one I will requite you three. When the mayor heard that, he laughed all day. Dun, dun, dun. So now Gimel the Norte goes and uh, begins task number one. Gimel the Norte set out for the king's palace. So he's leaving the mayor's, now he's going to the king. By order of the king, prince and governors give just verdicts. Gimel the Norte came before the king. He prostrated and did homage before him. O oh, noble one, prince of the people, king whom a guardian spirit makes glorious. Let them give me at your command one chariot, that for one day I can do whatever I wish. For my one day, my payment shall be one mina of red gold. So he wants to rent a chariot, and he says, for that one day I'm going to give a whole lot of gold. So it's, sorry, um, Jerry Cooper, again linked in the description, notes that this is very interesting. It's completely the opposite of how Gimel Nanota approached the mayor. Um, so the kings, the mayors, the people in charge are supposed to protect their people. It's their whole job. It's their point of existence to look after everybody else. He's tried that approach with the mayor saying, I need help. Please help me. This is what your your job is. And the mayor has cheated him out of his nanny goat and by extension, his only item of clothing. So he's hungry and naked. Um, and instead of appealing to the king's better nature, that's pond, everybody, this is pond. Um, instead of appealing to the king's better nature, Gimel Nanorta goes in and says, I will pay you to borrow this chariot. I don't think you're going to help me out of the goodness of your heart. I'm going to pay you instead. The king did not ask him, what is your desire, that you will parade about all day in one chariot? They gave him a new chariot, fit for a nobleman. They wrapped him in a sash. His he mounted the new chariot, fit for a nobleman. He set out for Doranki, which is the city of Nippur. The bond between heaven and earth is what Doranki means. Nippur's a really special place. Yeah, the temples. Anyway, sorry. Gimon the Norta caught two birds. He stuffed them in a box and sealed it with a seal. He went off to the gate of the mayor of Nippur. You want to pick it up? Yes. <laughs> the mayor came outside to meet him. Who are you, my lord, who have traveled so late in the day? So he has no idea who he is, and that's part of the key of the story. This happens it's at least twice. It's a bit like Superman, except instead of putting on a pair of glasses, Gimel Nanorta has dressed up in fancy clothes and borrowed the king's chariot. Like fancy Nancy. Like fancy Nancy. We also have a five-year-old, in case people didn't know, who quite likes fancy Nancy. So... Um, the mayor came outside to meet him. Who are you, my lord, who have travelled so late in the day? The king, your lord, sent me. I have brought gold for Acor, temple of Enlil. The mayor slaughtered a fine sheep to make a generous meal from him, for him. So here we have the, this is a really fancy, exciting guest, so you don't just give him a goat, you slaughter a sheep, which is what uh, Gimel the Norta wanted in the first place. So this is working out quite well for him. While in his presence, the mayor said, ho-hum, I'm tired. But Gimel Nanorta sat up with the mayor for one whole watch of the night. From fatigue, the mayor was overcome with sleep. Gimel Nanorta got up stealthily in the night. He opened the box lid. The birds flew off into the sky. So he put birds in a box, as one does. <laughs> I do it all the time. And then sat with the mayor and after the mayor had fallen asleep, he lets the birds out. And then, this is the tricky part. Wake up, mayor. The gold has been taken and the box opened. The box lid is open. The gold has been taken. 
Gimel Ninorta rent his clothes in anguish. He set upon the mare, made him beg for mercy. He thrashed him from head to toe. He inflicted pain upon him. The mare at his feet cried out, pleading, My lord, do not destroy a citizen of Nippur. The blood of a protected person, sacred to Enlil, must not stain your hands. So it's interesting here we have a repetition of the phrase citizen of Nippur. The mayor initially called Gimel Nanorta a citizen of Nippur, but it afforded him no special protection. He was still cheated out of his only goat uh, by the mayor. And here the mayor himself is pleading special treatment. Um, Please don't beat me because I'm, I'm a special person. I'm a citizen of Nippur. You can't treat me like this, even though he treated another citizen of Nippur in a very similar fashion. So if you catch what's happening here, uh, Gimel Nanorta had a box. He put birds in it closed it and sealed it with a seal, uh, ostensibly a royal seal, yeah. or it looked like one. And he was bringing this, what he what he said was um, uh, a mine of gold to give to the temple, yep. right? And it was, in, an it was entrusted to the mayor. Um, you don't lose the king's gold. So yeah. It's not, not a good plan. So the mayor falls asleep, give him the nor to opens the seal, lets the birds fly out, so now the thing's empty. Ostensibly picked it up before, it would be somewhat weighty. And he wakes up the mayor and says, while it was in your care, somebody stole the gold, and he beats him. It's a legitimate response, I think. They gave him for his present two minas of red gold. For the clothes he had rent, he gave him others. As Gimel the Norta went out the gates, so he's, well, you I mean, you can tell now he's, he's made his money effectively. Right. It wasn't his money to begin with. Yeah. So he, he's got a mine of red gold now that he's earned plus. Uh, uh, and he ate some sheep. Yeah. And he ate some sheep. As, as Gimel the Norta, see, this is why you're here. Yep. You're the brains of the I'm operation, girl. Really. As Gimel the Norta went out the gate, he said these words to Tukulti Enlil, who minded the gate Joy of the gods to your master, say thus to him. For the one disgrace you laid upon me, I've requited you one, two remain. Ha, ha. When the mayor heard that, he ostensibly laughed all day. Gimel the Norta went to the barber. He shaved off all his hair on the left. He filled a fire-scorched pot with water. He went off to the gate of the mayor of Nippur. He said to the doorman who minded the gate, Say that I want to come in to see the mayor. Who are you that you should see him? I am a physician, a native of Isin, who examines where there are disease and uh, emaciation in the body. I always want to read that emancipation. Yeah. And you that's can. not right at you all. You can. I probably shouldn't, though. So, um, Isin is the city of physicians. Patron uh, goddess, Gula, with her pet dog. Right. And, and Isina. I'm uh, adding things just by my presence. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> Sorry. So shaving the head, um, you know, it, it, it makes him look like a, a physician from Nip, I mean from Issen. And he comes and he says, I can I can treat you. From the beatings that this horrible, horrible someone else who totally wasn't me gave you because you lost the king's gold. When Gimon the Norta came before the mayor, he showed him his bruises where he had thrashed his body. Now if you Sorry. So he said, I am such a great physician. I am an amazing doctor. I can tell you where you have bruises without With, you showing me. That's like, how good I am. One there and there and, and there. And, and the mayor goes, and the mayor goes, oh, how did you know? You're not that the, other guy, are you? Right, because the mayor has more than one shirt. So he's still fully clothed at this point. One would hope Gimel Lunosa has clothes on as well. Also, The mayor said to his servants, this physician is skillful. I am a moron. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, you want to go ahead and pick so it up? So then Gimel in order and see if you can catch the clever bit here that the mayor really should have paid attention to. Gimel in order says, my lord, my remedies are carried out in the dark. Pause for just a second. If um, the guys from uh, Milwaukee Atheists are watching, this is the story I was talking about, or if you saw the stream, this is the, the story that I was talking about. Uh, because we read about one of the judges that takes um, Ehud takes Eglon into the dark and says, "I have a secret to tell you." Okay, and they go and he kills him. Anyway, yeah. sorry. 
My lord, my remedies are carried out in the dark, in a private place, out of the way. It's very considerate of him. And see, this would not maybe have raised many um, warning signs because um, medicine and magic in the ancient world were quite intertwined. So having a private darkened room to carry out your magic medical healing things is, you know, reasonable. Um, and you have to have a black mirror. It's also been suggested that some remedies may be painful to the uh, the sick individual, so having them out of the way so they don't distress their loved ones could also have been a reason here. So he brought him into an inaccessible chamber where no friend or companion could take pity on him. He threw the pot, this is the pot of water that he had in the beginning, into the fire. He drove pegs into the hard-packed floor. He tied his ha head, hands and feet to them. Then he thrashed him from head to toe. He inflicted pain upon him. Poor guy. Do you see a pattern developing here? I do, which is impressive because I've been drinking. <laughs> so, um, something also to note here, um, uh, he drove his pegs into the hard packed floor. Apparently this, the hard packed floor can also be read as a bed. So you've got kind of a double entendre thing going on. Gimel Nanorta, as he went out the gate, said these words to Tukulti Enlil, who minded the gate. Joy of the gods to your lord. Say thus to him. For one disgrace you laid upon me, I have requited you two. One remains. Gimel... Uh -huh. Nice. Sorry. Gimel Nanorta was careful, pricking up his ears like a dog. He looked carefully at the folk around him. He scrutinized all the people. He sent a certain man, having recouped his losses. He gave him a nanny goat for his present. So he's, it's just interesting how he does this. He starts off with a nanny goat, he loses it. Now he's recouped his losses and he gives the nanny goat as sort of a payment for this guy. And he says, go to the gate of the mayor of Nippur, start shouting. So all the numerous people will crowd around at your shouting. And he says, say, I'm knocking at the mayor's gate. I'm the man with the nanny goat. So, you know what it is? It's, um, what's that born, born identity, born? What's the third born movie? Like, you guys can say it back to me through the screen. What is it? Born identity, the I, born? They all blur into one after all. Well, the one where he's, you know. Supremacy? It, maybe. I don't know, but they all leave. Monarchy? Yeah, the born monarchy. <laughs> born monarchy. That's what it is. Anyway, it <laughs> that is, is so it is, funny. So he tricks him. Everybody leaves, and then he goes in and goes into the safe. And uh, it is, it's, 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 um, it was better in my head when I thought it. Now that I'm saying it, so okay. Gim and the Norta crouched under a bridge like a dog. The mayor came out. Born supremacy. Iron charity assist. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um. Okay. The mayor came out at the man shouting. He brought out the people of his household, male and female. They rushed off, all of them, in pursuit of the man. While they, all of them, were in pursuit of the man, they left the mayor standing outside alone. Go for it. What do we think is going to happen here, children? Based on experience and the past two times this has happened. The mayor's in for a beating. Gimel Ninorta sprang out from under the bridge and seized the mare. He set upon the mare, made him beg for mercy. He thrashed him from head to toe. He inflicted pain upon him. For one disgrace you laid upon me, I've requited you three. He left him and went out into the open country. The mare, crawling, went into the city. The, the end. end. And now you will all sleep well and not have nightmares of some random bloke called Gimel Nanorta beating you senseless <laughs> because you stole his goat. Well, that went a lot faster than I thought it would. It did. It did. It did. Ha ha ha. Um, we should start another one. Okay. You want to do... Let's uh, ask. Who wants to hear another one? It's like, oh, also Milwaukee Atheists is here. Hi. They said, behold. 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 It's hot in here. It is really warm. I'm going to go turn the air conditioner on. Okay. You, you want to do outro houses? 
Uh, yes, at your houses. Who wants to hear the Mesopotamian flood story? It's uh, 227. Thank you. Page 227. Class, turn to page 227 in your textbooks. <laughs> Shut up. What? <laughs> I'm being funny. I know. It's why I laughed. <laughs> okay. At your houses. This is um, the flood story that people say the Bible plagiarized from or the Bible is based on. It's not really plagiarism. Authorship works in a very, very different way in the ancient world. You don't have the same um, attribution of a story to a single person, at least not this early in history. And it's not, it's not stealing. Plagiarism to me implies a, a moral judgment. And you just, you don't get that. It's more of a sense of intertextuality and using the literary culture that is around you to inform your own writing. Let's define that um, because actually a question came up this week. Um, somebody actually said to me, um, what, what is intertextuality specifically? It's your mom. <laughs> it was not your mother. It was not your mother. Well, it might've been, I mean, who knows? It's, and it's YouTube. But... See, this is more Acadian humor, everybody. Yes, it's A-H. That was not funny, as it turns out. That's part of my charm. See, I say really stupid things ah, and then... See, Clockwork Rex now says that the Bourne Ultimatum was the third in the series. Oh. He, uh, he IMB'd it. Or she. I have a really hard time knowing your genders, people. So if I get the wrong gender, I'm really sorry. Yeah. I'll just... Everyone is now they. Okay. You're all they. Ha. There we go. Um... So, right. Intertextuality... No, that's, Sorry. I didn't mean to... No. You make more sense. No, well, that's that can't be true. That's impossible. So, um, intertextuality is an important thing to understand because, again, as Megan was saying, there's not this idea of that's my text, right, or that's you your can't text. Have it. Um, what you what you end up having in the biblical text, in the Mesopotamian text, is um, these texts. I mean, they really do have agency, right? So. Um, they interact with one another and um, they inform one another. And, and so, you know, you can have something like um, the book of Kohelet, the, the writer of Kohelet late uh, quoting in or alluding to very strongly the Epic of Gilgamesh. And there wasn't this thought that, oh, you, you know, you knocked, you knocked off the Epic of Gilgamesh. You don't have it's, enough imagination to come up with your own story, so yeah. you're stealing everyone else's. Yeah, I mean, and this is, you know, this is, well, anyway, so that's an important thing to note. So um, when we come to something like Atrahasis, um, which is the name of the uh, Mesopotamian, one of the names of the Mesopotamian Noah character, means exceedingly wise, um, which has its own, and it doesn't matter. It does, but just not right now. Um, you know, this this is a story that it's very early, relatively speaking, you know, early second millennium at least, and you know, predates the biblical flood story by a very long time. And uh, but that doesn't it, and it continues to be copied into the first millennium. Yeah. This was a popular story. But that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean that you have to look at the biblical text, for example, and say, oh, well, they you know, they didn't, they didn't, you know, come up with this on their own. They didn't come up with the idea of sending out a raven and sending out a dove and, you know, um, the floodwaters receding once it hits a mountain. They didn't come up with that on their own. So that means it's all, you know, useless. It's all worthless. Well, that's, that's going too far, right? Does it, it, it does say something about how you need to understand the text, right? But um, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's just worthless. Um, it's as valuable, at least to me, it's as valuable as any other ancient Near Eastern literature, so, which is very valuable, I would say. I'm reading it to you, so. Okay, so Atrahasis um, is a story, but you want to summarize it? You want me to do it? You should do it. Okay. Um, that required apparently a lot of thought. So Atrahasis has a lot of stuff uh, going on in it. This is where um, humanity is created. The gods, you know, originally are created. They rebel, and uh, Enlil gets really scared. And anyway, so he they decide they're going to create humankind. 
so that we can do the work instead of the gods. Right, which is exactly what happens in Mesopotamian culture, right? This is a reflection of Mesopotamian culture. Humanity is there to feed and to serve and to care for the gods. It's a symbiotic relationship, right? Is that a good use of symbiotic relationship? Come on, somebody. Come the on gods me. protect us from sickness and diseases, and you pray to them and they make your trade profit, your trade and caravan reach their destination safely and all this kind of stuff. And in return, you give the gods offerings because they apparently are incapable of feeding themselves. Right. Unlike Gimel and Orta, who is smart enough to find his own damn sheep. Thank you very much. It's funny when I went through this text, just to show you guys, uh, you ever heard the phrase, if you highlight everything, you highlight nothing. This is what I did when I went through it. Oh, okay, I, I went to the wrong part apparently to show my highlighting. But blue. Yeah, when I mean, you highlight everything, you highlight nothing. That's cool. Uh, so so uh, the gods create humanity, and now my iPad isn't working. They create humanity, and humanity gets really loud. Seriously, they get too noisy. Too loud. Just too. So instead of asking them to keep it down like reasonable people, the gods decide that they should just drown them instead. Yeah. It's a good idea. Enki does not like this idea, so he kind of tricks the other gods and warns his favorite guy in the whole entire world that the flood's coming so he builds a giant boat and they escape and it's all nice and happy so a couple of things there's no way in on god's green earth that we're going to get through the entirety of this no, text tonight no but we'll read a little bit of it and then we'll pick it up next time i mean we could but i like i like sleep yeah. rachel this what well See, I so Rachel Easton is saying that she wishes, wishes she could afford such books. I was going to say that this one is very affordable, but if you are struggling to buy food, then this really isn't affordable. Don't buy it, buy food instead. But this is available on Amazon, I think, for about $30. Um, and also, most of these texts you can find translations online, yeah. Um, not this particular book, I don't think, but a lot of them, if you just Google. Um, the name of the the story, you normally get um, a translation online. It might not be the most up-to-date translation, but it'll give you a good idea of what's going on in there. And it's a slightly more roundabout way to do it, but as we read it, you could just, you know, write it really fast. Yes. Oh, so <laughs> Akos Eros is saying that he's one of the really loud people that the gods are trying to drown. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, thanks. I'm blaming you. He plays a lot of classical music. I like classical music. Well, there you go. All right. Enough of all this. Why don't you start and I'll find a link to this book on Amazon. All right, sir. I gotta get back to the beginning. Okay, tablet one. Um, I haven't read from uh, Foster's translation here in a while. I suspect that we're starting with the old Babylonian version. I, I it's think, the most complete. Yeah, but I think he'll probably, there might be parts yeah. where he fills in. Yeah. So one of the things, sorry, one of the things that um, happens, the, the, the great things about um, Sumerian and Akkadian literary texts and texts in general is that we actually have the originals. Right? You have the clay tablet. You can see thumbprints on some of them. Um, so it's not like working with the Hebrew Bible or the uh, Greek New Testament where you're working with copies or copies of copies and whatever. Um, what that means, though, is that maybe you're working with something from the early second millennium, a clay tablet, and you get down near the bottom and it's broken off because that happens to clay. Well, if you have a copy from the later second millennium or even the first millennium, because the stories are so similar as you go through, you can reasonably fill in the gaps with a later text, uh, a later uh, a copy of it. So we'll tell you when we do that, but we're starting with the old Babylonian version. So first half, first part of the second millennium uh, BCE. And here we go. When gods were man, they did forced labor. They bore drudgery. Great indeed was the drudgery of the gods. They forced, the forced labor was heavy, the misery too much. Pons doesn't like the forced labor. He doesn't. The great Anuna gods, the seven, were burdening the Agigi gods with forced labor. Anu, their father, was king. Their counselor was the warrior Enlil. Their prefect, prefect was Ninurta. 
and their bailiff, Enugi. They had taken the, by its sides, they cast lots, the gods took their shares. Anu went up to heaven. Enlil took the earth for his subjects. The bolt, the trap of the sea, they had given to Enki, the leader. Those of Anu had gone up, uh, those of Anu had gone up to heaven. Those of Enki had descended to the depths. Those of heaven had nothing to do. They burdened the Igigi gods with forced labor. The gods were digging water courses, the waterways of the gods, the life of the land. The Igigi gods were digging water courses, the waterways of the gods, the life of the land. Just to kind of stop for a second, right. you know, you have the, the big three, Anu, Enlil, Enki. Anu takes the sky, Enlil takes the earth, Enki takes like the Apsu, the subterranean waters. We have daily data on all these. I, every time I say that, I feel like I'm burdening you. As an Agigi god, I burden you to put another link in the description. I'm sorry about that. That is okay. As one of the seven Anuna gods. I'm just kidding. I'm not one of Okay. Uh, so they're digging the waterways of the land. Of course, you know, if you've been, I can always reference these videos. You know, if you if you know anything about uh, Mesopotamian landscape, particularly in the south, hello, Pond. Um, he's trying to get my beer. Um, you know, canals, waterways, water courses. Very important. Very important. Not just the Mesopotamia, of course, the Nile Valley, the Indus Valley. But they provide not only water for... Um, for crops and annual flooding for um, growing crops, but also they are really important um, means of transportation. Mesopotamia, like the phrase Mesopotamia covers a huge area um, and all the different cities traded with each other and you get people from Southern Mesopotamia right near the Persian Gulf trading with people all the way up in what's now modern Turkey. And when they go upstream, they have to take donkeys and they're traveling for six months. But then when they come back down, they can go on rivers and canals. It's also a great way to transport goods. So you get in the Gilgamesh story, you get Gilgamesh and Enkidu cutting down cedars and floating them back down the river to the city of Or. And as they're coming, Uruk, they say... Not Or. Ignore me. It's Uruk. Gilgamesh is Uruk. As they're coming down, they say, just around the river bend. They do, because you know, as everybody knows, that Gilgamesh made it to North America. <laughs> now, before you carry on, we have a couple of questions. Milwaukee Atheist. Are the Atrahasis, Ziasudra, and Utanapishtim flood stories just different, different versions of the same story? Yes. Yes. That was easy. That was the easiest question of the day. You're the man. Uh, Rachel Easton says, I did find a video of the reading of Atrahasis by some channel called Ancient Astronauts Archive. Oh, boy. Yes. So, a, qu <laughs> a quick word here. Um, channels that have names like Ancient Astronaut Archive are like everybody making their videos with a specific purpose. Our specific purpose is to educate and provide access to scholarly information. By scholarly, I mean non-insane and peer reviewed. Scholarly information to people who don't have the time, resources, money, all this stuff to go and do a PhD. Because frankly, insane people do PhDs, normal people get jobs. Um, Wait, we have PhDs? Yes, but you have a job as well. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. There we go. Uh, so that is not to say that everything they put out is ridiculous and should be disregarded. Even though you want to say that? I want to say that, but I'm, I'm not gonna going to say that because I haven't watched the video myself, so I don't know if it's reliable or not. Um, but when you watch this stuff, even if it's just a reading of a translated story, watch it with a little bit of skepticism because you don't know who translated it, what translation they're using. They may be using a translation from the 1950s by Zachariah Sitchin, who has decided that actually gods are aliens and put spaceships in the story. And they're generally speaking are a lack of spaceships in Mesopotamian literature. I haven't read everything for myself, but I have yet to come across an actual spaceship. So definitely watch it. Um, hopefully they've just found a decent translation and they're doing what we're doing and putting information out there for people who don't have the time to go and track it down themselves, but also be aware that the translation may not be as accurate as you would like. And, you know, just like when you read, um, just like when you read something like the New Living Bible, where they're, they're 
taking some liberties at times with the text, uh, trying to make it, uh, trying to put it in, I don't know, more entertaining language, more entertaining English. That sort of thing can happen. So there's a guy, um, Stephen Mitchell, that did a translation of Gilgamesh, the Gilgamesh epic. And, you know, he the basic storyline is the same, right? But he takes liberties and adds some things and... I read that one and it's a great translation. Well, it's an entertaining translation and what he's doing is trying to get the feeling of yes. the text across. So the things that the original author was trying to, the feelings the original, original author is the wrong term, but you get what I'm saying. The, the things that the original compiler was trying to get across, the emotions he was trying to convey, translating that into modern vernacular to try and produce the same emotional response. That means that it's not an, an accurate word for word translation. Um, but you get like the gist and the sense and the feeling of the story. What you don't want to do is then, for example, if you have a new living Bible or even sometimes the NIV, um, for those of you that read the Bible, you wouldn't want to go back and try to make linguistic arguments from a new living translation, right? Or the new living Bible, whatever it is, uh, because they're trying to be very paraphrastic. They're trying to get big picture things across. And so you you wouldn't want to make um, linguistic arguments using that. Okay, that's enough said about that. Uh, right. So they're, the Gigi gods are digging the water courses. The Gigi gods dug the Tigris River and the Euphrates. Sorry, we had another question. Oh, sorry. Um, so I want to. I just want to get questions out of the way as they come because otherwise I will forget about them, and we don't want that. Um, so. Eng613 says, does writing change? I mean, can one tell if the writing is from the same time? Yes, writing changes. Um, cuneiform is in use for like 3,000, 4,000 years. Uh, so the script changes. Um, you can look at a foundation inscription from the early dynastic period, which is really, really, really early in history, and then look at something from the neo Assyrian period, which is really late. That's when the, Bab uh, the, the Babylonian captivity happened. And they're written in very different scripts. Neo Assyrian. The thing in the world. Thank you. Neo Assyrian script is very linear, very regimented. I, it almost looks like they've drawn it with a ruler. Um, and early dynastic script is much more pic pictographic. Um, and there are more fine-tuned yeah. differences. For example, in Akkadian, you can tell um, that something comes from, let's say, the old Babylonian period. <clears throat> Words had what's called mimation. So the word king is sharum, and it ends with an M, sharum. Uh, but in <clears throat> later periods, uh, even slightly later periods, that final M drops off. So sharum goes to sharu, no M on the end. And so you can you can date <clears throat> even with some some finely tuned accuracy. You can tell not only the date, but depending on the vowel coloring, uh, a vowels and e vowels, <clears throat> depending on how they they're laid out in Akkadian, can tell you this is a northern text or a southern text. This is in um, you know uh, Assyrian or Babylonian um, Akkadian. So good question. Excellent but yes, question. you can. <clears throat> okay, uh, the Agigi gods dug the Tigris River and the Euphrates thereafter. Springs they opened up from the depths. I'm going to stop you there. Sorry. Um, this is also showcasing an interesting phenomenon in that there are multiple creation stories in the ancient world. Um, there are a couple, in, even in the Bible, conflicting creation stories um, that are often people try and make them work together. Um, this is um one creation story from mesopotamia another one is the enuma elish that i'm starting to read i did the first tablet yesterday um you can follow the sultry sound of her voice thank you dear <laughs> <laughs> so there are lots of different um ideas about how the world was created in the ancient world and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive um yeah, I just wanted to point that out. By the way, if you like the stream, the Milwaukee Atheist pointed this out, or should did this today, and I thought it was really great. If you're liking the stream, like what we're doing here, give us a like, subscribe to the channel. Um, I think you can click something that says share somewhere. I'm not technologically savvy, but I'm sure that it can be done. So do that. You know, if you're on Twitter or something, tweet it out. Um, get people in here because, you know, I think this is it. We're doing this for you. That's why we're doing it. 
Well, and for me too, because I get to drink a beer while I read Acadia. Hey, come on, what's better than that? What's not to love? Okay. Um, I'll read a little bit more and then you can do it. Okay. That was a question more than a <laughs> statement because you're in charge. Springs they opened up from the depths. Wells they established. The depth of the land within it they lifted up. By the way, if there's a pause like that, that means that it's broken. And we don't know what it says. So if you if you look, oh, will that focus? Yeah, see those breaks? That means that I'm pausing and I'm I'm going to leave that out for uh, for accuracy. I could just make stuff up, but we don't want to do that. No, that's not. They heaped up all the mountains, years of drudgery, the vast marsh. So you hear them talking about the landscape there in Mesopotamia, right? You have mountainous regions off to the east and up in the north. Uh, you have the marshes down in the south. So that, you know, the Tigris and the Euphrates River. This is an etiological creation story, as Megan just pointed out. It's explaining how it happened. I helped. <laughs> you did. They counted years of drudgery and 40 years too much. Forced labor they bore night and day. All right, you're up. They were complaining, denouncing, mustering down in the ditch. Let us face up to our foreman, the prefect. He must take off this, our heavy burden upon us. The god, counselor of the gods, the warrior. Come, let us remove him from his dwelling. Enlil, counselor of the gods, the warrior. Come, let us remove him from his dwelling. Awila made ready to speak. He said to the gods, his brethren. So Awila, side note. So Awilam is a man, like a human. It's the word for man, like Adam. That's going to come back. Dun, dun, dun. <clears throat> And said to the gods, his brethren, let us not smite the prefect of olden days. Then there's a gap. Yep. Let us kill him. Let us break the yoke. Someone made ready to speak and said to the gods, his brethren, let us smite the prefect of the olden days. The counselor of the gods, the warrior. Come, let us remove him from his dwelling. Enlil, counselor of the gods, the warrior. Come, let us remove him from his dwelling. Now then, call for battle. Battle, let us stir up warfare. The gods heard his words. They set fire to their tools. They put fire to their spades and flame to their work, work baskets. This is possibly the very first recorded instance of a mob with flaming pitchforks. Hmm. Not so, a vampire, though. No. No. So in case you're having trouble following what's going on, they're pissed because they don't like digging in the dirt. I mean, Heaping up mountains and laying marshes. and Yeah, it's very tiring work, even for a god. So um, instead of bringing their concerns, forming a union, which would have been my first step, and then bringing their concerns to their manager and going on strike, they decide that actually the best way forward is to set fire to their tools, drag their leader out of his dwelling, and then beat him. Yes. Shane, you're awesome. Shane, you you're the man. Job. Thank you. Shane's putting our Twitter stuff up there. The man, the myth, the legend. Yes. Shane. <laughs> exactly. So they're going to drag Enel out of his house and kill him. There's a lot of a lot of beating tonight, isn't I know. there? We're we'll try and choose something a little more relaxing next time. We're repressing feelings. Of, no, we're not. <laughs> we're actually pretty transparent people. Yes. <laughs> Shallow. I'm, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't get that far. Fine. Anyway, <laughs> off they went, one and all, to the gate of the warrior and Lil's abode. It was night, halfway through the watch. The house was surrounded, but the god did not know. Interesting, isn't it? How. The gods are here. They can be very capricious. They don't know what's going on. Of course, there's not a whole lot of difference sometimes from the Bible. So. Yeah, they're a bit special. It was night, halfway through the watch. Achor was surrounded. Achor is the name of Enlil's temple. But Enlil did not know. For those of you that want to know, Achor is made up of two words. Of course, for our the Sumerian, Sumerian grammar people, people they know they're way ahead of us. A2 is house or temple, and Kor is mountain. So the mountain house. Exactly. Uh, which tells you a lot about Mesopotamian conceptions of religion. The temples were literally the houses of the gods. They were places where the gods lived because you had these cult statues in the shape of gods. Um, and they were considered to be, we said um, earlier, Doranki, the, bo the um, bond the bond of heaven and earth. That's literally what a temple was considered. It was the, so you read about it's something like... the like, linchpin holding the world together. Yeah, I mean, you think about something like the Tower of Babel that's supposed to reach up to the heavens. You have to consider that in light of this Mesopotamian idea of the temple, right? And it's something that that, that binds heaven and earth together. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. 
Um, I think Akos Eris is sad that there isn't a lot of stabbing going on. I'm sorry. There's not a lot of stabbing in Mesopotamian literature, is there? <laughs> exactly. What should we do next time? Well, next time we should finish out Trahasis. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting distracted. Um, we can do the one where the, the um, oh man. Describe it. The one where the, the, the guy's head is put on a stake out of the gate. Um, uh, it definitely sounds like a much lighter read. If Dr. Del Nero is watching this, I'm so sorry he would kill me. It's it, the MS. It, it, that's what it is. It's the MS. Um, damn it. Okay, anyway, we'll find it. We will. There are stakes and heads flying around, and it's great. can't remember the name. It's awful. <laughs> so back to Adra Hussis. Kal Kal noticed it and looked out. He touched the bolt and looked out. Kal Kal woke Nusku, and they listened to the clamor of the Agigi gods. Nusku woke his lord. He got him out of bed. My lord, your house is surrounded. Battle has run right up to your gate. Enlil, your house is surrounded. Battle has run right up to your gate. It's the first Jesus. He's like in the boat and the waves are... No, I'm just kidding. Enlil had provided weapons for his dwelling. Enlil made ready to speak and said to the courier Nusku, Nusku, bar your gate. Get your weapons and stand before me. Nusku barred his gate, got his weapons and stood before Enlil. Nusku read, made ready to speak and said to the warrior Enlil, My lord, your face is gone as pale as tamarisk, your own offspring, why do you fear? My lord, your face is gone as pale as tamarisk, your own offspring, why did you fear? Send that they bring Anu down here, and that they bring Enki before you. So basically, go and get the big guns out, we need help here. I mean, this is interesting, right? Because Enlil is... Like, he's the destructive force. So, you know, you don't expect Enlil to be kind of cowering, you know, behind his, his uh, minister. You know, hey, get your weapon. Why are you so scared? You know, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting picture. Mm -hmm. He sent and they brought Anu down before him. They brought Enki before him. Anu, king of heaven, was present. The king of the depths, Enki, was. With the great Anuna gods present, Enlil arose. The debate was underway. Enlil made ready to speak and said to the great gods, against me would they be trying this? <coughs> Bless you. Shall I make battle against my own offspring? <coughs> Bless you. Can we edit that out? No. Damn it. So again, we see as in um, Enuma Elish this interesting kind of conversation of, should I really kill my kids? That's not nice, but also either they're noisy or they're trying to kill me or... Eh, not sure what's going on here. What did I see with my very own eyes? Battle ran right up to my gate. Anu made ready to speak and said to the warrior Enlil, the reason why the Yagigi gods surrounded your gate, let Nusku out, let him learn their cause. Let him take to your sons your great command. Enlil made ready to speak and said to the courier Nusku, Nusku, open your gate, take your weapons, go out to the group. In the group of all the gods, bow down, stand up, and repeat to them our command. Anu, your father, your counsellor, the warrior Enlil, your prefect Ninorta, and your bailiff Anunagi have sent me to say, Who is the god who is instigator of battles? Who is the god who is instigator of hostilities? Who is that stirred up war? That battle has run up to the gate of Enlil. So they're kind of sending out poor Nusku as um, like their spokesperson. The Igigi gods aren't angry at Nusku, so he can quite safely go out and say, what are you doing? Why are you angry? And by the way, for completely nice and friendly reasons, who exactly is your ringleader? And can we have his name? And someone, please point him out to me. Nusku took the command, opened the gate, took his weapons and went with the command of Enlil. In the group of all the gods, he bowed down, stood up and set forth the command. Anu, your father, your counsellor, the warrior Enlil, your prefect Ninorta, and your bailiff Anugi have sent me to say, who is the god who is instigator of battle? Who is the god who was instigator of hostilities? Who is it that stirred up war, that battle has run up to the gate of Enlil? We should turn the fan on or something. It is, for some reason, well, very you hot read, here. You read out on the fan on. The Agigi answered him in the group. They were defiant, the labor gang, Every one of us gods has declared war. We formed our group in the ditch. Excessive drudgery has killed us. Our forced labor was heavy, our misery too much. 
And so every one of us gods has resolved on a battle with Enlil. Nusku took the command. He went. He brought back. My lord, you sent me to the group of the gods. I went. I bowed down. I stood up. I set forth your great command. All the Agigi gods, the labor gangs, were defiant against it. Every one of us gods has declared war, they said. We have formed our group in the ditch. Excessive drudgery has killed us. Our forced labor was heavy, the misery too much. Now every one of us gods has resolved on a battle with Enlil. When he heard that speech, Enlil's tears flowed down. Enlil became disturbed at what he said. He said to the warrior Anu, Noble one, you should take authority off with you to heaven. <clears throat> take the power you still have. With the great gods in session before you, summon one god. Let them make a new, <clears throat> a new authority. Ea, who is Enki, made ready to speak and said to the gods, his brethren, What do we denounce them for? Their forced labor was heavy, their misery too much. Every day the earth was, the outcry was loud. We could hear their clamor. There is a task to be done. Mommy, the birth goddess, is present. Let the mother goddess create a human being. Let man assume the drudgery of the god. They summoned and asked the birth goddess, the midwife of the gods, wise Mommy, which is spelled M-A-M-I, I guess we could say mammy, but... We could, but that sounds weird. Yeah, we so will. So not... Will you be the birth goddess, creatress of humankind? Create a human being. Let him bear the yoke. <clears throat> the yoke, let him bear the task of Enlil. Let man assume the drudgery of God. Nintu made ready to speak and said to the great gods, It is not for me to do it. This task is Enki's. He is the one who purifies everything. Let him give me the clay so I can do the making. Enki made ready to speak and said to the great gods, On the first, seventh, and fifteenth days of the month, I will establish a purification, a bath. Let one god be slaughtered, then let the gods be purified in it. Let Nintu mix clay with his flesh and blood, let that same God and man be thoroughly mixed in the clay. Let us hear the drum beat for the rest of time. From the flesh of the God, let a spirit remain. Let it, <clears throat> let it make the living know its sign. Lest he be forgotten, let the spirit remain. So a couple things that <clears throat> I could point out here, and I'm sorry, I keep clearing my throat. Um, it's interesting that there has to be a death, right, in order for humanity to be, to be created. But look, it's not a sacrificial, like a Enlil is not saying, I will give my life to create humanity. Let's kill one of the other dudes. Let's kill one of the other ones, right? So the drum beat is heard, which of course is uh, understood to be the heartbeat of humanity. And very the, poetic. very poetic. You wanna read for a while? You mean? I do, we have another question, N613. Seems to me that the langu language itself was advanced as of today, or basically you're making it so we can understand. Um, so we're not making, we're not changing the um, the phrasing at all. We're just reading directly from Foster's translation. Um, and no, you're right. It's not a literal translation because the syntax um, works very differently in Akkadian as in English. If we left it or if translators left it in the original syntax, it would... Uh, it would make sense, but it would sound very strange and very mm. wooden. This verb order is weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, weird for us, for yeah. English. So what, what people will do is they'll, well, what people, how I do it when I'm translating, I'll write out a literal translation of a, a phrase um, until I reach a, a natural stopping point, and then I'll read through the literal translation and just put it into good English so that it can be understood and it sounds more natural. Um, than a very literal wooden translation. So and that's, that's what, all that's happening here. But no, I mean, it is it is, it is a very advanced. I mean, this is a, of course, this isn't in. Um, this is this is a relatively late text. It has, it's written um, 
with a very fully developed grammar. Um, if you look at some of the older texts, you don't get the same grammatical um, richness. So you, people have to infer quite a lot from what's written. But you know, really by the, uh, by the end of the third millennium, <clears throat> well, yeah, strike that. I mean, in the middle of the, the third millennium, um, the language has developed significantly. I mean, you, you know, you understand the grammar well. Um, of course, you know, there are some, there are some places that, uh, really still have difficulty, but <clears throat> particularly by this period, early second millennium, uh, this is the great literary period, right? Of Sumerian and Akkadian, uh, literature. So, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. It's, it is, it is very sophisticated. Yeah. Clockwork Rex is saying, so it would sound like Yoda in the original. We're 900 years old. Your age look as good. You were not. Hmm? So we need to do a literal translation of something. So not, And say it in now. Yoda's voice. You can say it in Yoda's voice. I'll say it in my voice. Fine. I don't have another voice. <clears throat> Josh is the impressionist in the family. And that's a sad thing to say. Okay. Uh, what time is it? Yeah, it good. is 9.15. We can go for another 15 minutes. You guys up for another 15 minutes? They don't have a choice. Yeah, you don't. Like, I mean, you do. You can just <laughs> you can you just leave. Click. <laughs> we'll read to the cat. It's fine. Where did we get to? Uh, the Great Anuna Gods. I'll read a little bit more than you find. Read some more. Yeah. Yes, mum. You have to turn. Ah, uh, there's the drum beat. Ah, I was on the wrong page. <laughs> the Great Anuna Gods who administer destinies answered yes in the assembly. On the first, seventh, and fifteenth days of the month, he established a purification, a bath. They slaughtered Awila. Remember that god from earlier, the instigator of the whole problem, um, whose name is Man. So they slaughtered Man, who, would, uh, who had the inspiration in their assembly. Nintu, which is another, word for the, another name for the birth goddess Mami, Nintu mixed the clay with his flesh and blood. That same god and man were thoroughly mixed in the clay. For the rest of time, they would hear the drumbeat. From the flesh of the god, a spirit remained. So the, the idea here is that um, the clay provides like the substance and the physical nature of man, but the kind of like the intellect, the spirit of humanity comes directly from the god who was sacrificed. Uh, from the flesh of the god, a spirit remained. It would make the living know its sign, lest he be forgotten. The spirit remained. This is very different, very different from the biblical text. We have the dust, and then they breathe the breath of life. Oh, Zanus Paul says he'll never leave us. Oh, thank you. And yes, we have a massive cat. An MC. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway. You're very patient with me. Sorry. Uh, lest he be forgotten, the spirit remained. After she had mixed that clay, he summoned the Anuna, the great gods. The Agigi, the great gods, spat upon the clay. Mami made ready to speak and said to the great gods, You ordered me the task and I have completed it. You have slaughtered the god along with his inspiration. I have done away with your heavy forced labour. I have imposed your drudgery on man. You have bestowed clamour upon humankind. I want to point out something here. We keep saying the Anuna, the Anuna, the Anuna. I think we might have mentioned this in a previous stream. Um, you know, the Anuna, that's what, you, if you hear the Anuna key, the Anuna key uh, in these videos, the, the Anuna key is a rendering, a much later rendering of Anuna Kefor in Sumerian. Right? See, so the Anuna, that's who they are. The, um, the, the Kefor is a, a Sumerian grammatical marker. And it's picked up later in Akkadian, uh, and, and and it's rendered as Anunnaki. There's an I-E um, fluidity, I suppose. So uh, the Anuna are the ones, and you can see it here being, you know, written out the Anuna. The Anunnaki are the Anuna. It's just they're misunderstanding that Kef 4, uh, which is a Sumerian grammatical marker. For those of you that are taking the Sumerian grammar class, you, will you know what's up. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I just want to point that out. Um, so it's a real word, but it's not a real word, if that, does that make sense? It's a misunderstanding of a grammatical feature. Yeah. Like Jehovah is a real, it's not exactly the same, but Jehovah is a real word, right? But 
but it's a misunderstanding it wouldn't of have been un, it wouldn't have been understood by the people who wrote that particular text right if you want to watch the video about that we have it in daily data but yahweh <clears throat> consonants and adonai vowels being mixed together incorrectly make jehovah anyway sorry i have released the yoke i have made restoration they heard this speech of hers they ran restored and kissed her feet saying formerly we used to call you mammy i see i i told you not to say it like that now i'm saying it mammy how did you say it mommy mommy it's because you're british you want to say mummy i do which is not the word no now let your name be mistress of all the all the gods belet kala ili your turn and the young girl so there's a break here and yeah. then we pick up somewhere else and the young girl her breasts a beard those are two things that i don't want to go back to back they don't actually in the text there's a break anyway I, and the beard goes with the next line yeah on the cheek of the young man in the gardens and street wife and husband will choose each other the birth goddesses were assembled and nintu set reckoning the months and the destined time uh, at the destined time they summoned the 10th month the 10th month arrived she opened the womb just quickly sorry um clockwork rex said don't say nibiru nibiru is just a, the sumerian way of writing the city name nipple it's not now a the, super secret planet it's the city nipple so there's a okay so if you go to particularly first millennium astrology which is a whole field unto itself really and oh yeah in a seriology uh the texts are can be very enigmatic. There's a text called Molapin, for example, that is about the um, the plow uh, constellation. But um, Nibiru is uh, a rendering of uh, which star is it? Nah, it, it it actually shifts a little bit. It's the Pleiades, isn't it? Pleiades is those six oh, yeah, dots the six that you dots. see in that VA two six seven. But um, I forgot what I was saying. Nibiru. Yeah, so I mean, you do see this, for example, a place that you'll see it when, when uh, Megan gets to it in the Anuma Elish. Um, you'll see the Anunnaki there or the Anunnaki. You'll see Nibiru or Nibiru, depending on how um, it's pronounced. But it's uh, it's one of the things. It's the the um, uh, it's the star of Marduk, I think. Don't quote me on that. It has to do with Marduk. It's something directly related to him. No, I don't see any evidence. I, I want to be careful how I say things. Josh is much more um, willing to give crazy ideas the benefit of the doubt. Um, I shouldn't say crazy ideas. Interesting, interesting ideas the benefit of the doubt. I think we have a say, good. I think we have a good dynamic here. Right, and say if you like, I'm going to keep an open mind. Come and show me your evidence, and I'll decide for myself. I'm going to say if you think that the Sumerians were given the art of writing by aliens, that you're a moron, and you actually haven't done the research to know that, and it's a ridiculous assertion to make because we have so much evidence showing the development of writing from an administrative tool to the wonderful full script that you see. I mean, we do, and you know, I think I think the big thing to keep in mind with this this thing because it is it's a very popular thing and. Um, I mean, it's an important thing to engage with uh, that that I would say most Assyriologists have they have so many other things that they're doing that engaging with something like this. When somebody says we think writing was given um, by, you know, aliens, they think we have, I'm not even going to deal with this because we have so much evidence of the development of writing that it didn't come from aliens. Um, I, I'm... Come prove it to me, right? That's where I'm at with this. So. Christian Trask is saying Nibiru is Jupiter. Okay, yeah. Uh, and the thing is, it's it it it's not a standardized thing in a serological um, text. So it actually can shift. If you look up the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary, you can see all the the, the usages of Nibiru, Nibiru. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure Jupiter is is one of them. Um, anyway, but be no evidence that I know of that it's a tenth planet or 12th or whichever planet it's supposed to be. Anyway, good questions. Sorry, I have something in my contact lens. I will be right back. All right, um, so the 10th month arrived. She opened the womb, her face beaming and joyful 
With covered head, she performed the midwifery. She girded the mother's middle. As she pronounced the blessing, she drew a circle with meal and placed the brick. This is a ritual. We won't get into the details of it here, but again, this is etiological. It's explaining where this ritual come from. I am the one who created. My hands have made it. Let the midwife rejoice in the sacrosanct woman's house where the pregnant woman gives birth and the mother of the baby is separated. Let the brick be in place for nine days. Let Nintu, the birth goddess, be honored. Always call mommy their mistress. Always praise the birth goddess. Praise Kesh. In when the bed is laid, let wife and her husband choose each other. At the time for being man and wife, they should heed Ishtar in the marriage chamber. For nine days, let there be rejoicing. Let them call Ishtar Ishara at the destined time. Okay, I think that's probably... Um, there's a lot of... Well, we're, yeah, we're just about to get to tablet two, so why don't we finish oh, yeah, we this are. first one? Yeah, sorry. Um, I'll read a little bit more then. So there's a, a gap, but basically humankind is created and they are taught how to reproduce. Always exciting. Um, and they are given the job of feeding and caring for the gods. All right. So it's going to get really fragmentary, but I'll go through it. A man cleansed the dwelling, the son to his father. They sat and he it was who was carrying. He saw and... Enlil, they took up, they made new hoes and shovels, they built the big canal banks for food for the peoples, for the sustenance of the gods. So this is describing the work of this new humanity that's just been created. So they're providing for the people and they're providing for the gods. 1,200 years had not gone by. The land had grown numerous. The peoples had increased. The land was bellowing like a bull. The god was disturbed with their uproar. Enlil heard their clamor. He said to the great gods, The clamor of humankind has become burdensome to me. I'm losing sleep to their uproar. Most parents, I'm sure, can empathize with this. Let there be a gu. So it's a break, three lines, uh, but it's he. I think that's all. Hmm? Oh, I've always pronounced that ague, a burning ague. A G U E. I think it's org. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm I sure don't it know is. that for a fact. This is what happens when you read Leviticus 26 in the King James Version all your life to yourself. The burning ague. Yeah, org. We're going to say it like that. It's better. It's not something that comes up in, you know, your emails. Well, not in your emails. <laughs> okay. I'm going to email you tomorrow just with. Org, <laughs> and you'll be like, ah, this is why I married that woman. <laughs> Deleted. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm going to read now. You're being mean. Oh, sorry. Did you want to say anything? No, no. So I don't want to get in more trouble. Humanity is being too noisy, which is a problem. They have an ague. We have an ague. We're an org. Josh. If, if anyone Josh, in the chat, I think you pronounced that wrong. <laughs> moron. <laughs> chat knows how to actually pronounce that word a-g-u-e we what can just assume that it's you we could just assume that it's you we should, you. We should. you're british you know pronounce <laughs> everything okay brant makes a great point thank you for making this point if super chat was enabled i'd like to donate some money we would love you to donate some money very much because what we get in donations goes to our summer scholarship program. If you haven't looked at that, I'll put a link in the chat in a minute. We are raising money to sponsor a PhD student next summer for a research trip or for a staying at home research period where they can sit and write and come up with all this interesting knowledge and then come on the show and tell us about it and tell you about it. So we have a Patreon. It's uh, patreon.com forward slash ham uh, digital hammurabi. We do also have a PayPal account. If you only want to give a one-time donation, that would be amazing. Uh, that's but all of that money straight we to... We don't take a penny. And, and as a matter of fact, I think there's a... I can't remember what percentages the Patreon takes. Um, what we're going to do is out of our personal funds, whatever, let's say, they, let's say uh, out of $2,500, 
that's donated to Digital Hammurabi to support this um, student, let's say $200 is given to Patreon or whatever it is, we're gonna- We'll make that up. We'll supplement that, um, we'll pay that in. Because I think it's important that you guys know that what you give- We're also yeah, it's, it's, contributing to is, is going, yeah, um, that's right. But if you do want to give a one-time donation, we don't have super chats because we don't, we're not monetized by YouTube yet. We, we have to have 4,000 hours of people watching us, which is one of the reasons we're doing this stream. So help us get there, right? If you like what you're watching, and clearly somebody does, this is great. 23 people do. Oh. Wow. That's pretty good, actually. Man, please. Um, we're going to be on for a couple more minutes. But when we do these, you know, like, subscribe, share the link, um, tell anyway, your friends. Sorry. Um, if you do want to do a one time donation, sorry, honey. Sorry. If you want to do a one time donation, we take PayPal, um, digitalhammerobby at gmail.com would be awesome. Or take a look at our Patreon because we have some cool stuff on Patreon. And that starts as little as $1 a month. Um, and hopefully soon we'll get monetized and you can do super chats, yeah. which would be amazing and hilarious. And a lot easier to see, frankly. Yes. I'm blind, but so yeah. I wouldn't be able to see them anyway, but I could see them. But she could see them. Clockwork anyway. Rex is now saying, so Marduk slayed Tiamat and used her body to create the universe according to their creation myths, yep. according to one specific creation myth, according Enuma to Enuma Elish, which is a Babylonian creation myth that explains, um, the political supremacy of the city of Babylon in terms of um, the uh, primacy, uh, primacy isn't a word. Um, in primacy. primacy, there we go. In terms of the primacy of their city god, Marduk, in the like um, mythological realm. But yes, in the Enuma Elish, Marduk slays Tiamat, who's this giant sea monster thing that gave birth to all of the gods. He kills her, kind of chops her body up. It's a delightful image. Um, like a fish. Like a fish. Part of her body is the sky. The rest of it is the land. And the Tigris and Euphrates rivers are, flow from her eye sockets. So we know it's true. We do know it's true because it's written in cuneiform. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. We are going to finish up the last of this tablet. Oh. Bless. Grant is going to be our Patreon. Thank you, Grant. Oh, man. What, what? what? Anyway. Thank you. That's um, amazing. Oh, and Shane linked our Patreon. Fantastic. Shane. Fantastic. You guys are just incredible. They are. Oh, and Math, Ma Math Magic Pagan, that's a great name, is saying, is Josh not supposed to be reading the Bible? Um, Josh was going to be on Skylar's show tonight to read the Bible, but... Tomorrow night. Skylar has moved it to tomorrow night due to family commitments so and we for those of you that didn't see it i was on milwaukee atheist today um which was awesome so if you if you haven't gone to their channel and subscribed i said this earlier but uh a really cool channel i, I really had fun with those guys uh, milwaukee atheist we read through judges one through three it's a lot of fun and uh, judge is going to be a great book so if you can tune in and, and listen to their uh atheist sunday school every sunday uh, 1 p.m. Central Standard Time because they're out in Milwaukee. I didn't realize that, so I was sitting here with my coffee and my Bible at one o'clock here in Maryland, going, "Oh Hello? wait, <laughs> Hello, Hello." I'm special. That's what we've determined here. Okay, sorry, we're almost done. <laughs> we just, I'm so I was genuinely apprehensive about this. I, I find live streams quite stressful, but this has been an awful lot of fun. Yeah. So thank you. Um, anyway, we're going to finish up this tablet and then eventually I might go to bed. But we're going to meet Atrahasis. We are going to meet Atrahasis, who's a super cool guy and saves, well, I was going to say humanity, but he doesn't. He saves his family. Okay, but really he's a dick. Let's just be honest, I right? Know. Yeah. Hey, yeah, if he you, uh, hey, if you seal up the outside of this boat, you can have my you can palace. Have my palace. We're getting ahead of us. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I love this stuff. <laughs> 1,200 years had not gone by. The land gr had grown numerous. Oh, we did that one. Oh, we did? Yeah, we're down here. But oh, he, I'm Atrahasis. sorry. But he, Atrahasis, his god was Enki. Enki is a tricky bastard. He was exceedingly wise. And this is key, sorry. Um, uh, if you go to the uh, YouTube channel of uh, Penn Museum and watch Dr. Steve Tinney, he's got a great uh, lecture about this, about Enki and wisdom and before the flood. Uh, here with Atrakasis and with Gilgamesh, but the point is that Atrakasis means exceedingly wise, and Enki is the god of wisdom, 
And if you know anything about Iwanis, um, Adapa, all these wisdom characters that are responsible for wisdom in Mesopotamia, the point here is that Enki is trying to save the wisdom of humanity. That's what he's doing. Um, and that's why when Atrakasis afterwards, when you see this, he gets sort of uh, sent off to the ends of the world, one of these Nagu uh, on the Babylonian map of the world. Sorry, I'm getting way off here. Gilgamesh goes to get the wisdom from before the flood back. That's the point here. That's why he's called Atrakasis. That's why Enki is it's uh, talked about the god of wisdom. It's, it all plays in here. Sorry. Yes. Um, but he, Atrakasis, his god was Enki. He was exceedingly wise. He would speak with his god, and his god would speak with him. Atrahasis made ready to speak and said to his lord, How long will they impose the disease on us forever? The, the ague. The ague. So the <laughs> gods have inflicted humanity with plague to try and bring their numbers down and quieten them down. It's probably the ague. Probably the ague. Enki made ready to speak and said to his servant, Summon the elders at the usual time in your house. Command. Let the heralds proclaim. Let them raise a loud clamor in the land. Do not reverence your own gods. Do not pray to your own goddesses. Seek the door of Namtar. Bring a baked loaf before it. May the flower offering please him. May he be shamed by the gift and withdraw his hand. So he's, Enki here is telling Atrahasis how to get the, uh, the relevant gods to remove the plague. Um, and Namtar is the name of that god. And that name means like, the one who cuts fate. Nam is fate. fate. Tar is to cut. This is Sumerian. Nam Tar, cutting of fate. Um, kind of like the fates in, in Greek mythology. Only better. Only better. May the flower offering please him. May he be shamed by the gift and withdraw his hand. Atrahasis received the command and assembled the elders to his gate. Atrahasis made ready to speak and said to the elders, Elders, something, 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 command. Let heralds proclaim, let them raise a loud clamor in the land. Do not reverence your own gods, do not pray to your own goddesses. Seek the door of Namtar, bring a baked loaf before it. May the flower offering please him, may he be shamed by the gift and withdraw his hand. The elders heeded his words, they built a temple for Namtar in the city. They commanded and the heralds proclaimed. They raised a loud clamor in the land. They did not reverence their own gods, they did not pray to their own goddesses. They sought the door of Namtar. They brought a baked loaf before it. The flower offering pleased him. He was shamed by the gift and withdrew his hand. The org left them. They resumed their clamor. So what happens? Enki tells Atrahasis, go and tell the city elders to do this thing. And then the city elders tell all of the city, okay, stop praying to your own personal gods. Stop praying to your household gods or whoever it is you pray to. Concentrate people on Namtar. Namtar is the person we need to make happy, bring him offerings, pray to him to stop killing us, basically. Yeah. And um, Namtar was so shamed because everyone was being really super duper nice to him. He felt so bad that he stopped the plague, which was very cool of him. And you'll see this pattern develop in Atrakasas. Enki is, he's, he's going to be the trickster. He's going to be the calculating um, strategist that works on behalf of humanity to keep them to keep them alive, frankly. And um, even though ultimately the flood is going to wipe out, you know, the majority of humankind, uh, Enki still works out a way to um, to keep humanity going and to save the wisdom that humanity has. So I feel good. This was a lot of it fun. It was England. It was. Sorry, I'm typing and speaking, and I'm. It's not a good idea. Did you say this was England? I did say this was England. It's it I was, was England. Typing England as I was speaking. And well, I think it's a good way to say it. This was, it England. was England. It was a lot of fun because that's what England is. Pip, pip. Jolly good show. Quite right. I love you. <laughs> I'm glad that we don't have a lot of fun and everything is very serious and scholarly. Are there any questions that people have? <sighs> Before we finish, is Enki considered a trickster god? I mean, I keep saying trickster. Yes, in the sense that um, he he gets his own way he, through he, trickery. Yeah, it's not like a Loki. Yeah, he doesn't like delight in chaos. He's trying effectively to um, preserve his way of life because he thinks it's better than you know killing all of humanity yeah. that 
provide him with food. Yeah. Um, and none of the other gods agree with him. So instead of taking them on full frontal, he's going to work around um, and come up with a, a more subtle way of getting his outcome. Yeah, you probably don't want a full frontal from Anki. <laughs> Why? Why is that funny? <laughs> I love you. I don't love you. That's what happens when I have a couple uh, of beers, apparently. Math Magic Pagan. Um, I'm not in England. No, I was raised in Buckinghamshire. I've been in the States for seven years now. So. And we are very happy to have her. Oh, you are. I don't know about the rest of you. Oh, I'm pretty sure they're happy. It, 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 you know, I make this assumption here that um, everybody wants to wants to hear and see Megan. Uh, it's one of the reasons that she's on these streams all the time. They're like, I, I force her into the camera because, like, she's the. You're very pretty too. Yeah, you're right? the one that's you're, you're the one drawing the crowd. So come on. Anyway, Brian said he just became a five dollar and one cent patron because he doesn't believe in aliens. We don't believe in it. Well, <laughs> I don't know if I believe in aliens. I don't believe in aliens and Sumerian culture being a product of alien civilizations yeah so awesome thank you very much we really appreciate it and yes buckinghamshire like the palace like buckingham palace except it's not buckingham palace isn't in buckinghamshire that's in london um aylesbury was the nearest town and i grew up in a tiny village called edgecott if it's that beautiful means anything to anyone it probably won't because it's like this big yeah um it's amazing ah magic math pagan is from northern ireland cool Nice. Nice to see you. Um, Xanus Paul wants to know what the cat's name is. This cat is Pond, um, after the Doctor Who character. And we have another cat somewhere. He's probably hiding. He's quite shy. Who is called Thomas, who is named after himself, I believe. Our daughter named him. Um, Clockwork Rex says that you're cool too. And Beej, thank you, Beej, for remembering to remind me because I forget this all the time. Beej says... Don't forget to mention your upcoming interview with Jens Notroff. We have one of the archaeologists working at Gobekli Tepe coming on the show. And if you wait one second, I will tell you the date that he is coming on because I always forget. Um, 24th, right? I think it was, but I want to make sure. And, you know, here's the thing that's that's kind of going on. Actually, we were talking about this today. Um, September 25th. 25th. Mark your calendars, people. September 25th at, I even have a time. Um, I did have a time. Hmm. While she's finding it, um, you know, I kind of do the daily data, right? Which, um, you know, it's what I, it's what I have time for for this sort of hobby of mine. Um, Megan really is the brains behind the operation. And one of the things that um, we were talking about today is the next step is we have several people that are, are very willing to come on and do interviews. The problem is that there is this seven month old in the other room um, and our other two kids. And it's just, it's difficult, I think for Megan to to swing that. However, as um, young Oliver learns to sleep through the night a little better, um, I think that, and I don't want to speak for you here, mm -hmm. but I think that's the next step here is that we're going to try to do more of these live streams, uh, particularly during the weekends when I have time to do that. And then we're going to try to um, have some of these interviews. For example, um, Dr. William Reed, who is a really good friend of ours, uh, but a brilliant scholar, Hebrew Hebrew Bible specialist. He's awesome. He really is. a super nice guy. Um, anyway, he's going to come on and talk about the Deuteronomistic history. For those of you that don't know what that is, uh, how is it that um, the the first, really a lot of the Old Testament, but um, particularly the, um, there's this debate about how the Pentateuch came together and how the, uh, books, particularly of um, Deuteronomy, really through Second Kings, kind of came together, and so he's going to come and talk all about that. The, the different theories. There's been, you know, uh, there have been theories that have developed since Julius Fellhausen with the JDP documentary hypothesis. If you're familiar with that, 
and uh, European scholarship in the last couple of decades has moved away from that. And so there's been this debate, um, particularly in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and so the documentary hypothesis in its original form has kind of gone away and there's a, a reworked documentary hypothesis that's come back and then there's European scholarship and what they think. Anyway, he's going to sort it all out for us and give a good introduction, or at least I hope I'm not putting too much pressure on him if he sees this. He's going to watch this and panic. Yeah, sorry. That, William. You don't panic. Be yourself. Yeah, yeah, point. yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't have said any of this. But he's whatever he says is gold. Just trust me. He's amazing. Um, NKG5, we don't have a date for William yet. Um, yeah. he, actually, he did oh, no, ask he did. me. He said maybe the, the 22nd. 22nd. Of so I've been going back through my email and um, emailing with Dr. Nodroff. He said, um, I said a Saturday would be great. And then I suggested the 25th of September, which is not a Saturday and will really not work for me because I'll have three children home from school. I've done that. Um, so All we're time. not doing that on the 25th. I'm going to email him as soon as we finish streaming and arrange a different date that is a Saturday. Um, Which would be the 29th then? Maybe the 29th, I don't know. We'll have to see what Dr. Notrop says. So ignore everything I just said about him coming on the 25th because that will, if we do that, we'll have lots and lots of children yes. who are delightful and wonderful, but do not help with interviews going And on. if you wanna see Paige slap me, which I know is probably something everybody wants to see. One of the early uh, daily data that I did uh, it's on the Akitu Festival uh, has her slapping me at the end. So a little plug there if you want to go watch it. It's a little four-minute video. Uh, she had a lot of fun with it. She did. It was her she was very answer. excited, and the slap was a little unexpected. So Aaron Bender says that he's been enjoying the latest daily data. Oh, awesome. I said that you're doing an awesome job. Uh, Eng613 said, thanks a lot. He's going to bed, I think and said thank you for taking time to answer questions, that we're doing a great job. Um, NQ25 has clicked the notification bell. See, this is a thing I keep forgetting exists. You have to turn notifications on if you want to see our um, our what's-its, our what's-its, our notifications, really, I suppose. Well, we will probably, uh, we'll probably sign off now, yeah. but if you could do us a favor before you go, if you've enjoyed this, just go down and click the like button. That would really help us. Yep. Um, if you if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. That would be amazing. And I really appreciate all of our Patreons. And again, all the money is going directly to sending a very poor um, but very excited uh, PhD student that our Patreons will select. Yep. And that all of you will Patreons get to experience. Get to vote on this. Yeah, Patreons get to vote. It's kind of like America's Got Talent. I nearly said Britain's Got Talent, but I'm in the wrong country. Either it's one. like America's Got Talent, but with academics. Yeah, it's going to be a um, lot of fun. Probably less eyeshadow. Well, Josh could wear eyeshadow for the selection process. I'm not sure if that yeah, would help. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess we got to come up with something for like the $10,000 uh, yeah, Patreon category or we something. No, I'm just kidding. So thank you all very much for coming on. This has been a lot of fun for us, and I think we're going to try to do more of these. Uh, any last comments? That uh, I don't think so. All right, very just good. Just that, um, sorry, um, I've said to Rachel Easton, I will be doing a reading about Trahasis. It might take me a while because I want to get through um, the Enuma Elish first, but it will come, I promise. Yep. yep. And it will definitely be a good translation and no aliens. So we will make sure that we tell you the next time we're going to do a book club well in advance. So, you know, go, if you can, get Foster and read through the rest of our mm -hmm. or find a translation online and be uh you know be ready to discuss it with us in the chat and um yeah i think this has just been really great yeah so, thank you all for joining us thank, thank you, you everyone in the chat thank you shane for moderating and for all the great questions and we had a lot of fun and we will be back soon so until next time resist poor scholarship always ask how, how do, do you know, know that good night